Hi, my name is Steve Gotts. I'm the head of business at DIFC Innovation Hub, and I'd like to welcome you to today's edition of DIFC Unplugged. Today, we're excited to welcome Brees Merrick, uh, Managing Director of uh, Middle East and North Africa for Ripple. Brees, thanks for joining us. Great to be. Thank you. So, Reese, I, I want to start at the at, at the beginning. So, Ripple is one of the one of the oldest blockchain companies uh, that's been in existence, um, and you started your journey in the Middle East. So you joined DIFC in 2020. Um, could you maybe talk a little bit about kind of your background and what brought Ripple to uh, to DIFC? Absolutely. So, you're right. We've been in the uh, the industry for a, for a long time now. Certainly, one. Um, of the longest standing kind of blockchain and technology providers. Um, and really what we're, I guess, initially known as is for our product uh, offering. So Ripple really believes that crypto and blockchain solutions can really solve some of the inefficiencies when it comes to moving funds cross-border. Um, and primarily the XRP and the XRP Ledger, which is the native um, blockchain that Ripple uh, build our technology over, has the best value and use case for moving value in real time. So we built a product called Pay- Ripple Payments, which essentially serves uh, hundreds of customers to move funds in real time globally. Um, but really what we're seeing is an evolution of our, our product offering. So we have stepped into other areas of focus, um, custody being one, stable coins or another and really what we want to be able to provide is a full infrastructure solution for financial institutions when it comes to crypto and digital asset adoption as we are a technology provider we have built as i mentioned our technology on the xrp and xrp ledger we also want to be in a position where we can nurture some of the startups and developers who are also going to utilize what we believe is the best protocol for moving value in real time. Fantastic. Fascinating. And I'm, and I'm curious. So you set up in DIFC 2020. Um, big moment was 2023 when, uh, when XRP was approved by, uh, by DFSA. Uh, what was the significance of, of XRP getting, uh, getting approved under the DIFC's virtual, virtual asset regulation? You know, what I would say is the DFSA have done a, a fantastic job in building a a pro-regulatory framework for crypto and blockchain innovation. And really what that approval provided was clarity. So essentially what that means is XRP is an approved digital asset that can be utilized by DIFC um, licensed digital asset players under the digital assets regime, Um, meaning that there's complete clarity for entities to incorporate it into their products without the risk of any repercussions further down the line. How does Ripple think about navigating the regulatory landscape, given that you, in some parts of the world, you have regulators that are taking a more aggressive approach? Uh, You also have some regulators that are taking a more progressive approach. Does this kind of feed into kind of Ripple's kind of strategy around global expansion? Absolutely. Um, It's no secret that Ripple always want to be able to meet with, um, educate, have discussions, open discussions with global regulators. And that's kind of been our um, thesis from from day one. You know, we want to work with regulators. We want to be able to build our business globally in jurisdictions where there is clarity um, and there are rules of the road. Now, you're completely right. Some um, geographies are far more advanced than others. um, And that really is where Ripple are seeing a lot of growth, not only in our product, but where we are expanding as a business. UAE arguably has done one of the the kind of best jobs, I believe, in terms of providing that seat at the table for businesses who are entering the space to provide kind of guidance, clarity on how regulation should be done in this region. Um, So it's, you know, certainly an area when we're looking to to grow and, and, and pour resources into that definitely comes into play. So maybe kind of double clicking on that. So, um, you spend a lot of time with DIFC, the regulators. I'm curious, what's your experience been in DIFC, and, and how do you kind of compare and contrast that to maybe some other jurisdictions that you're working with? Uh, what we want to be able to see is and encourage is developers, startups, to be able to come to this region where they have that support to be able to grow and flourish as a, as a business. You're right, there are some jurisdictions where we haven't seen that level of engagement um, 
US being one of them. Um, so, you know, but there are many that are, you know, if you look across Europe, yeah. um, Singapore, Hong Kong, Switzerland, UK, you know, we're, they're very much a bit more advanced in terms of kind of what they're doing compared to the likes of the US and so on. I'm glad to hear that. So uh, I want to talk a little bit. You mentioned growth. I want to talk yep. a, l- a little bit about growth now. So um, Ripple recently made some waves. Uh, you, uh, you announced a, a partnership, a collaboration with DIFC Innovation Hub to, uh, to accelerate the adoption of blockchain uh, technology. Can you share a little bit about, um, about the nature of that partnership and what some of the goals and objectives are? Of course. So if I just take a step back and something I kind of mentioned um, at the beginning when we look at Ripple as a business in our focus, one of the key areas is to um, support and develop builders on the XRP ledger. Um, as we, as we, as I mentioned, you know, it's for us the best protocol when it comes to moving value. And we believe there's a lot of uh, benefit that builders will get from developing their products on the ledger. That being said, when we're looking at certain regions, you know, Ripple want to make a commitment to areas where there are, you know, forward-thinking regulation, where we can work with startups to be able to build on the ledger, and where they will be able to to grow. So when we do that. We want to be able to partner with somebody in region who has that area of expertise to be able to give these startups every success of um, growth. So it was an obvious choice for Ripple when we look at the DIFC Innovation Hub to kind of partner on our accelerator program. You know, you're a home to over a thousand kind of early stage startup companies, the largest innovation hub uh, in the UAE. And really what we want to get out of this is to work in partnership, as I say, to provide that level of support that a lot of entrepreneurs don't get. They may have fantastic ideas, but when it comes to building, to scaling, to having that guidance when it comes to regulation, to licensing, to building a business, I think that's where we see the biggest benefits for um, you know, the, the businesses that we are co-working with. Yeah, absolutely. And it, and I think there's two aspects to the partnership, right? So I think there's the scale-up yep. piece and there's the, the early stage piece. Can you maybe talk about how you're thinking about using these kind of different programs and the objectives of each? I think the startup piece is a lot more kind of hand-holding to begin with. They're providing a lot more, or we're providing a lot more kind of, I guess, guidance in the early stages to basically get it from zero to one. Yeah. I think um, as we look at the early growth companies, I think that's an element of looking how we can incorporate an offering to build on the ledger. So they may already be existing, but it's a case of, okay, how can we educate these businesses that may already be in operation to be able to start looking at alternative uh, blockchains to kind of build their products over. Brilliant. And I'm curious, so you announced a a billion dollar XRP XRP fund. Uh, Is that fund going to play a a part to the the partnership and the programs locally? Absolutely. I think Ripple are committed to providing funding to entities, um, as I mentioned, who are looking to build on the ledger. Uh, We have a 1 billion um, XRP fund of which we're looking to tap into. And I think what we've seen is a ton of, um, you know, adoption in this region. We're seeing a ton of innovators, entrepreneurs, developers flocking to the UAE. So we believe that, you know, it's certainly going to be, you know, very rewarding to give something back to these entities that are looking to to enter this space. Brilliant, brilliant. So I'm curious, uh, on the topic uh, of growth, so you're the head of uh, Middle East and, and North Africa. How is Ripple looking at these these regions, right? So U.S., Europe, kind of fairly mature uh, kind of ecosystems. But do you see unique opportunities in the Middle East or North Africa that you want to pursue? I think so. I think, you know, I moved here three years ago now. Back then there wasn't too much kind of regulatory clarity. Um, I think that, you know, the reasons why Ripple entered the space, as you mentioned, in in 2020, really was from our payment offering. You know, when you look at the amount of um, expats that are here, prox 90%, the amount of cross-border payments that take place, I think it was an obvious choice for Ripple to kind of, you know, plant the flag and be here. Um, As we are progressing, what I would say is, and, and our Ripple's offering is progressing, when we look at digital asset custody, when we look at stable coins, we're starting to see the large FIs kind of really look at how they can implement certain strategies around digital assets, whereby infrastructure like custody um, are going to be critical. 
uh, when we look at the wider kind of region from the Middle East and Africa, um, and you look at stable coins, for example, you know, the circulation of a USD uh, backed stable coin is huge. I think globally, 50% of transactions are, are settled in US dollars. A lot of those have to go via. Um, bank, uh, banking correspondence network, which can be timely and costly. So I think there's certainly opportunities for a number of regions that are pegged to the dollar yeah. for have that kind of in circulation um, across the region and, and Africa. What about de- de-dollarization? Is that something that you think about from a, from a stablecoin perspective? I think that, you know, there's... I don't think we talk about de-dollarization. I think that the U.S. dollar is always going to have and hold, um, you know, be the global currency. Mm-hmm. I think there are aspects and regions that are looking to kind of move away from that. Mm-hmm. Um, but we believe that a U.S. dollar-backed stablecoin will basically get rid of some of the inefficiencies that we're seeing within the kind of global cross-border payment network as it relates to U.S. dollar uh, payments. Right, right. So... Uh, I'm curious. So big focus on the Middle East yeah. uh, and Africa. What are some of the, the use cases that you're most excited about exploring with the partnership? I think we see, again, a continuation of, of payments. You know, being in the DISC, um, naturally, when you are a payment institution coming into the region, it's probably where you're going to look uh, to, to, to lay your hat in terms of setting up. Um, but there's some interesting um, projects around DeFi, I think tokenization of real-world assets will, will, will play a huge role kind of as we move forward, um, and we're excited to see kind of how they, uh, how they develop there. So you mentioned uh, tokenization of real-world assets, yep. and I feel like this is something we've been talking about for, uh, for many years now. Sure. Do you feel like we're, we're getting to a tipping point where we're all of a sudden we're going to see a wave of adoption around tokenized real-world assets? I believe so. I think, um, you know, the, the forecast is quite staggering as to it, you know, getting to a ten trillion dollar market cap by twenty thirty, right? And you know, the the jury's out to see whether that happens or not. What I would say is, large institutional players are coming in and very seriously looking at implementing such strategies around tokenization of real world assets. Essentially, you know, the market will catch up to the demands of the consumer, and to be able to make things more easier, more scalable, and get more reach. I think the large FIs are ultimately going to have to have to play in this space if they want to keep up. I think uh, uh, people are fond of, fond of saying the market follows Larry Fink, and uh, yeah. Larry Fink re- recently announced kind of his his de- declaration that Bitcoin is a security, yeah. digital assets, distributed ledger technologies are here are here to stay. I imagine this is this is music to your ears. Absolutely, I think when you have large players like Larry Fli- Larry Fink and Black- BlackRock kind of in the place, then. You know, ultimately, what that does is it adds um, validation of kind of the future and the, the right type of backing, I would say. Brilliant. Brilliant. So talking about growth, talking about kind of the focus on uh, the Middle East and, uh, and Africa, I'm curious, how do you think the collaboration uh, kind of aligns with Ripple's mission to create a more inclusive and efficient financial system? I think that the financial system is built on outdated technology. I think we'd, we'd both, both, agree, both yeah. agree there. You know, there have been maybe some advancements in terms of you know, speed, but cost remains a problem. I believe that ultimately it's still plumbing built in the 1970s as it looks to kind of the SWIFT network. So ultimately kind of rewiring the financial system is not something that's going to happen overnight. And certainly we've been, been making some great inroads over the last few years to do that. Um, and I think we'll see a continuation of that. As I mentioned, I think that innovators coming into this space um, will be able to see the benefits of the XRP and the XRP ledger as it relates to moving value. And therefore, then we'll start to see some of these uh, fantastic ideas come to fruition, I would say. Exciting, exciting. So I'm going to ask you to, to kind of put your futurist hat on and kind of think ahead. And I'm curious, um, what is Ripple's vision, right, for kind of a future blockchain-enabled uh, world and, and digital assets over the next, say, five to, five to ten years? Ripple's vision um, really hasn't changed uh, over the last um, you know, 10, 11 years. Really, what we're looking to do is build the Internet of Value. So essentially, that means is moving value like information moves today. Mm. And really, we don't see that. You know, I can send a WhatsApp or an email to kind of anyone in the room or my colleagues in Singapore and essentially that's going to be received there within within a couple of seconds at basically no cost. 
when it comes to actually moving funds cross border, you know, it's a very different experience depending on where you are and who you use. So that the mission remains the same. Mm-hmm. I think as a business, what we've seen is that having a it being able to provide infrastructure um, to large FIs, to large enterprise companies across moving value, but also looking at how that value is stored safely when it comes to custody, looking at some of the inefficiencies when it comes to um, you know US dollar payouts, that will be a continuation of our of our focus. Brilliant and. Um I want to I want to kind of follow up on one point you made. You, you you mentioned kind of adoption among kind of large financial institutions, and kind of obviously we mentioned kind of BlackRock has been come out kind of with some clarity on you know, the the opportunity around uh, DLT. I'm curious, do you see um, different rates of adoption uh, among FIs uh, across the globe? And if so, if so, like where where do you see differences? I think we do for sure, and we we do in the it's not only what they're incorporating, but, but how they're incorporating. I think if you look at certain regions like Turkey, yeah. for example, where you've seen the Turkish lira lose a lot of, um, you know, a huge amount of value there. Mm-hmm. And really, I think over 50% of um, people in Turkey are exposed to holding right. crypto. So if I'm a financial institution in Turkey, it's essential that I actually provide some form of facility for customers to buy, sell, hold crypto, Otherwise, I'm at risk of losing a large portion of my customer base. So there we're seeing kind of some real um, progression there. Really, that comes off the back of the regulation that's kind of taken place. In other areas, you look at the likes of, you know, HSBC, BlackRock, you know, Fidelity, kind of these guys are um, very much looking at uh, when it comes to ETFs, or they're Mm -hmm. looking at tokenization of gold or, or assets, Really, they're looking at how they can leverage digital assets in, in, in what I would say is an entry entry level point to start, and then maybe the types of crypto kind of uh, retail adoption that we'll see in other areas will, will play catch up. Uh, you've uh, you mentioned stable coins yes. uh, a, a couple of times now, and you've made some some acquisitions in the, the stable coin space. Uh, how do you how do you foresee that kind of that product roadmap kind of uh, playing out over the next next couple of years? And do you see it as being kind of core to your growth? I think so. You know, we we built a payments product. We've uh, transacted over 27 million transactions on that, um, and really, when it look when we look at our customer base, you know, a lot of the requests we get is, you know, I want to make a, a US dollar payout to Africa or a US dollar payout payout to China. So en- essentially, what that means is that the customer has to then make that US dollar payment over the SWIFT network. So really kind of as we look forward in, in, in the advancements of, of US dollar-backed stable coins, really to give that customer the optionality to be able to settle with a US dollar-backed stable coin in a region without having to go through the corresponding banking network yeah. would, be, would add a, a ton of speed, firstly, because yeah. it will be near instant, and it will cost a fraction of what that, what that cost is happening today. When we look at the roadmap, you know, that's kind of further down the line. The first point of, of call is for us to, us to launch and to have that perhaps in our, in our payment flow. Um, and by the end of the year, we should have that, that all in place. Exciting, exciting. Market is big enough for everybody. Absolutely. <laughs> Tending to go around. Brilliant. Well, Reese, uh, thank you for taking time today. This has been a fascinating conversation. And, and thank you for joining DIFC Unplugged today. Thank you. Cheers, Stevie.